Is inflation beginning to plummet? Well, the Washington Post thinks so. In this video, I'd like to show you a report from the Washington Post that suggests inflation is beginning to plummet. Now, I'd like your commentary on this, but let's go ahead and go through this and then I'll add mine as well. So here we go. From chicken wings to used cars, inflation begins to ease its grip. Let's take a look at this. The price of gasoline is dropping like a rock. Chicken wings are suddenly becoming a bargain. This, by the way, was a huge, huge issue when a wing stop reported that the price of chicken wings was up like 30 to 70%, depending on which quarter you were comparing to. Everybody was like, oh my gosh, who cares about inflation at 7%? We've got chicken wings going up 30% to even more for certain varieties of chicken. Anyway, so, so I think that's probably why they're mentioning chicken wings uh, suddenly being a bargain. Uh, because it hadn't been for a very long period of time. And retailers drowning in excess inventory looking to make a deal. You don't say. Remember my Black Friday video when I went around some retail shops and saw those TVs and computers stacked up? Yikes. After more than a year of high inflation, many consumers are finally starting to catch a break. Even apartment rents and car prices, two items that hammered millions of household budgets this year, are no longer spiraling out of control. Really important, and the Fed is recognizing as well, this fall of new leases being signed. And what they're actually paying attention to, and this is so important, they're actually paying attention to will that fall in new leases continue, or is it going to stabilize and potentially circle back up? That's very, very important. Uh, and something the Fed's really paying attention to. Global supply chains are finally operating normally as more consumers spend more in on in-person services like restaurant meals and less on goods and furnitures, uh, furniture goods. How's that going to affect restoration hardware reporting this week? We'll see that middle to upper end consumer. I mean, who really buys a restoration hardware? I, I don't know. I've never brought myself to buy there. I just can't spend a lot of money on furniture. We only have a $500 couch. And then after five years, we just get another $500 couch. It beats having like, a $7,000 couch that maybe lasts 10 years. <laughs> yeah, it's not worth it. Anyway, our opinion, of course, might be unpopular. Anyway, the cost of sending a standard 40-foot container from China to the United States uh, is West Coast. That would be like your Long Beach, Los Angeles, is now under $2,000 down more than 90% from the peak. This is true. We are seeing shipping costs plummet. It was one of the reasons I briefly shorted Zim. I made a little bit of money on that short. The moderation in inflation is just beginning to appear in government statistics. Well, that's bullish. In October, the Fed's preferred pricing gauge, the PCE, posted its smallest monthly increase since September of last year. Great. The worst of inflation is behind us, uh, says an economist here for T.S. Lombard. The question is, where does inflation settle? And this is true. That is probably the biggest question now is, is inflation going to chill at 5%? And if it chills at 5%, does that mean the Federal Reserve has to keep hiking uh, that is, maybe we end up going to a 6% terminal Fed funds rate, or are they just going to keep us at 5% for longer? That's the big concern right now, is how long is the Fed going to keep rates high? And I think a lot of folks are saying, well, the answer to that is, how long is it going to take for inflation to actually come down? See, this is the projection right now. We'll pull this up on screen right here. This is the Federal Reserve's projection. The black line was a month ago, and you could see us hitting about 5%, almost 5%, and then rotating down slowly into 2025, which is the bottom right corner that I'm kind of blocking there, is February 2025. Well, the blue line here, you could see us started falling sooner, falling as soon as about the end of 2023, and falling sooner. So a lot of folks, at least the market, pricing in this idea that eh, rates are going to go higher, but they're not going to stay high that long. Well, if inflation ends up stabilizing around 5%, maybe rates will stay high longer. Some folks, of course, are saying, hey, no, the Fed's not going to keep rates high that long because we'll, they'll end up pushing us into a depression. They'll have to have mega rate cuts coming very soon. I'm actually a fan of that belief, but it's, going to be a, it's all going to be predicated on how much inflation actually comes down and where it stabilizes. If inflation stabilizes at 3%, Honestly, I wouldn't put it past the Fed to just say, hey, look, for the last 10 years, we've been at 1% to 1.5% inflation. If we sit at 25 to 3% inflation for the next 10 years, we think that'll average out to about 2%, and we think that could be okay. So I do see the Fed loosening uh, their target a little bit with this argument that, oh, well, we still have a policy of flexible average inflation targeting known as FAIT, F-A-I-T, flexible average inflation targeting pronounced a FAIT. Anyway, let's get back over here and uh, let's see what uh, the rest of the Washington Post thinks here. 
Fed Chair Jerome Powell on Wednesday noted signs of progress, but said it's too early to claim victory. Yep, it'll take substantially more evidence to, uh, to actually be convinced that inflation is coming down. Sure, still, the Washington Post says, there are clear signs of improvement in merchandise pricing. This is interesting. As consumers resume their pre-pandemic spending patterns, excluding volatile food and energy, goods prices rose in October by 5.1%. That's sort of your core read. I believe they're using the PCE read here. Down from 12.3% on an annual rate in February. Yeah, well, that's when you multiply by 12, the uh, month over month. But anyway, as good prices begins begin to cool, pressure is building on services. Rising demand and limited supply, think short-staffed restaurants, has services inflation running at an annualized or annual rate of 6.7%, more than twice the figure a year ago. The expectation is that goods prices will continue to disinflate, but services more gradually and maybe more sticky. Most of what's happening now with prices reflects developments in specific markets or consumers return to pre-pandemic routines. The plunge in ocean shipping costs by itself has stripped roughly 0.7 percentage points from the inflation rate. Making credit more expensive, the Fed has put a major dent in the housing industry. All right, well, this is where now we get to talk about rents and home values. And what's interesting here is they say the full effect or they say here, but the full effect on the economy of how higher rates will take many months to materialize. This is despite home sales in October being 37% lower than a year ago. That's another big issue we face is when are we actually going to see the bottom of housing and will that drag down inflation in other areas? Think about some of the services related to housing and how those services could actually infect or affect inflation. You've got construction, title and escrow, loans, Open Door apparently just sent out an email. This is a rumor I saw, but somebody sent an email around saying, oh, Open Door is now closing their lending business. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, lending has almost no pricing power in this environment right now. I wanna say 95% of people would not benefit from refinancing right now. That's because they have rates that are lower than where current rates are. So lending's a really difficult industry to be in. But when you look at all the services related to real estate, think electrical, plumbing, handy folk, painters, drywallers, uh, anyone related to the building or renovations, which are important right before you go to sell a property, all of those services would expect to see disinflation as demand falls off a cliff in construction. Remember, generally what people do is they spend money to fix up their homes, ironically, right before they sell them. They don't even get to see those benefits or right after they buy them. But people are buying homes less and people are selling homes less. In fact, Redfin just put out a post about how the most properties are being delisted that they've seen in a very long period of time. I wanna see if I could pull the exact data piece here. I believe I have that handy. It is the Redfin blog post that just came out and uh, da, 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 there it is. Okay, sellers, okay, record delisting. 2% of homes were delisted without being sold each week during the three months ending November 20th. That compares to 1.6% a year earlier, suggesting the boom is over and there's a complete reversal in the housing boom time. Now, this is a record amount of delistings. They don't necessarily suggest in how long it is, but Redfin has a full blog post on that, so they might have some more details on that. Uh, either way, it's, it's clearly painful. And so we could see that just housing alone could push services inflation down as well, not just through fewer people buying, but also fewer people selling, pushing that real estate agent, title, escrow, uh, lending, and all of those services down. This is why we talk about the velocity of money, right? One person spends $1, well, that leads to five or $6 into somebody else's pocket. That's because they always think about the hot dog vendor. The hot dog vendor sells you the hot dog. You give the hot dog vendor that buck 50 for the Costco or Walmart hot dog. What do they do with that? Well, they buy more hot dogs. That gives the hot dog supplier jobs. It also gives the hot dog seller jobs. It gives the marketing company for Costco and Walmart jobs, right? It, it flows through the economy generally four to five times. Spending does. Savings only flow through the economy about one to two times, so, so they don't really flow through the economy as much. This is why the government's always encouraging people to spend your money, not save your money. That's why they give tax benefits to businesses for saving, by the way, or sorry, for spending, by the way. Uh, this is why people are like, oh, how come uh, all the businesses get all the big tax breaks? So you keep spending money. 
<laughs> uh, anyway, to be sure, in the $26 trillion economy, prices on some products are always falling, even as many otherwise rise. In June, when inflation reached its highest point in more than 40 years, prices nonetheless dropped uh, that month for bacon, window coverings, and men's sweaters, according to the BOS. So it's important not to exaggerate the recent improvement. Okay, interesting. With Europe and the United Kingdom in recession and China hobbled by its restrictive COVID-0 policy, global demand for oil has sagged. A barrel of Brent crude now goes for about 85 bucks, one third less than in the early March following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As a result, the national average gas price has fallen to $3.47, down 8% from a month ago. Now, gas spending is really heavily correlated to people's ability to actually spend on goods. Some folks say there's like a 1.5x multiplier on gas. So for example, if you could save 100 bucks a month on gas, you'll spend $150 more on junk. <laughs> uh, anyway, continuing on here. Many retailers find themselves with unusually high inventories. Yeah, no kidding. We saw that. Tolga, I don't know who the heck that is. Uh, Ikea's corporate parent told Reuters, okay, there you go, told Reuters this week that he was quite optimistic about being able to lower prices in the uh, months ahead. And the company did not reply to a request for comment. Fine. Walmart said last month it will look for pricing opportunities for areas where they can cut prices. Sam's Club recently cut the price of its in-house hot dog to a buck 38 from a buck 50, undercutting Costco. I mean, that's like a marketing gimmick. Let's be real. Living with high prices through the year has been a, has had a cumulative impact. Whatever, fine, fine. Okay, I've pre-read some of this and it's just kind of boring. A lot of pricing pressures. However, this is interesting. The situation reversed this fall when production rebounded just in time for typical seasonal decline in demand. The amount of chicken and cold storage jumped nearly 20% since May, according to the USDA. That's created some bargains, at least for restaurants. Wholesale prices for boneless chicken breasts have dropped dramatically over the past six months. At Wingstop, hey, that was one of the ones we've talked about. Fast food chain based in Dallas, executives said the cost of bone and chicken fell by nearly 43% for the quarter ending September 24th. That's crazy. We have a favorable commodity outlook, not only for bone and wings, but also for chicken breasts. And that's the other thing is, is you know, when you look at like the BCOM index, you, you see commodities have really flattened out uh, on, on their prices. This is, they're not plummeting anymore. They really, they fell, but they're not plummeting anymore. But it's certainly nothing like the kind of damage that we saw in March. So uh, in order to see BCOM, you could just do a quick little Google for BCOM. It's the Bloomberg Commodities Index. And uh, what you'll find is uh, you could either use Bloomberg or MarketWatch or whatever you want. And you could look at the BCOM chart, uh, which I'll pull up right here. This gives you BCOM here. This is the year to date index. You can see we're sitting at about a buck 14 down from about a buck 36, buck 34. But if you go out to the three year on this, you can see we're still well above where we were at any point in 2020 uh, or prior to 2022. So we're still up there, still some room for commodities to really come down. We just haven't seen that just yet. Uh, of course, there's a lot of hopium around that. But remember, folks, hopium is not an investing strategy. However, what might be is investing in your education by checking out the programs linked down below and building your wealth and using code PP. Continuing on to this, Wingstop hasn't lowered any retail prices, but said the new offering of the chicken, sing, uh, chicken wing sandwich for $5.29 and a combo meal. Uh, uh, well, okay, so basically they've introduced some new products here, right? That may come in at a new price without making other prices seem like they're coming down. And after soaring in 2021, wholesale used car prices are down 15% from January. New car prices are also slowly starting to correct. Remember, Tesla just came out with some new price cuts, really uh, trying to, for certain models, trying to pre-price in that $3,600 or so tax credit or providing a $3,600 rebate on certain vehicles bought in December. I think they're really trying to suggest, hey, look, we know there's a tax credit coming next year. Don't wait to buy. Buy now. We'd rather sell you a Tesla now. That, of course, gives rise to some people saying, oh, it's demand falling off a cliff again for Tesla. Who knows? Uh, I guess we'll find out in the earnings. Uh, you know, if, if, the, if Tesla does not sell all of the vehicles it produces, it's bad. It's going to be very bad for Tesla. Anyway, although Elon suggests that's not a problem, but then again, uh, Elon suggested some things before, and uh, those don't always come true. Sometimes they're a little more hope than actual reality. Anyway, more ample supplies mean fewer customers are paying above MSRP uh, for cars. The average new car in October sold for $46,991, which was about $230 above MSRP. In May, the average price a buyer paid was $721 above list. Usually this is always below list. 
So the fact that we're still above MSRP really shows that, yeah, things are improving, but prices are still up. Dang it, we got some work to do in other words. All right, apartment rents, meanwhile, moving steadily higher all year long are finally cooling. The national average rent for a two-bedroom apartment is up 8.1% from a year ago, down from April's 14.6% rate. So you're seeing that inflection point down, especially in areas like Boise, Phoenix, and Austin. Rental prices are cooling. Real-time rental data takes months to show up in government statistics. Yep, this is really talking about the owner's equivalent rents. Let's take a look at some of the comments here. And there are, wow, 2.6 thousand comments. Okay, let's just see if we can sort by the uh, most liked replies. Let's see what we got here. Of course, inflation is down. The election is over. <laughs> you gotta love the immediate, immediate tinfoil hat. Now, I know you can't blame some of this because some of the data just seems rigged. Like when we analyze that jobs data, it's like, really? All the private indicators are suggesting jobs are, are contracting, yet all of a sudden your establishment survey is coming in with growth? I get it. I get it. All right. Let's go ahead and collapse that one since uh, we'll call that one tinfoil hat here. What do we got here? Uh, either way, consumers are unimpressed. Speak for yourself. Those of us love driving around looking for chicken wings are feeling pretty smug. Uh, okay. All right. That's... Uh, that's one way to uh, suggest that you're enjoying lower gas prices and cheaper um, uh, cheaper chicken. Trumpists are here to vent their fury that inflation is easing. I mean, you have to say, like, you can't give Trump a total pass for the inflation just because most of the inflation fell on Biden's shoulders because a lot of the pandemic policies that were bipartisan under the Trump administration, right? Think Pelosi, McConnell, stimulus policies, and Fed policies led to the inflation that we have today. It would be really funny, although it's probably not likely to happen. It would be really funny if inflation goes to zero right as Trump takes office in 2024. Again, I think that's unlikely to happen, but imagine it did. Inflation zero and Trump is in office. It'd be kind of weird because it basically means Trump just missed out the painful inflation cycle. That he kind of also had some responsibility in causing. And I'm not saying Biden's hands are clean, right? Shutting down the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, North, um, not, the, not the Nord Stream pipeline, although they could have had their hands in that explosion. Shutting down the Keystone, big mistake. Should have been pumping more oil over here during the oil crisis. Uh, this person says, thanks, Biden. Well, he's not the only reason for that. <laughs> In fact, Biden probably has more to do with uh, base gas prices being up than down. Uh, besides Russia's illegal war and China's insane no COVID policies, I firmly believe we are overwhel the overwhelming driver of inflation was corporate greed. If you've never worked at a corporation, then don't comment. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. I really disagree with that. I think corporations are driven by shareholder demands, right? Shareholder demands are, hey, can you make sure we're increasing profits? Uh, while uh, while providing value for our customers, right? That is the mission statement of a corporation. How do we provide more value for shareholders? Remember, shareholders are people like you, me, people who are retired and employees of companies. So it is a job, the job of a corporation to maximize profit margin. And if people are willing to pay more, for whatever reason that is, if they're willing to pay more because they have more money or because there are shortages, then it is the capitalistic response for corporations to charge more money. If you don't like that, then you might prefer a system like communism, where when price ceilings are set in place, that is corporations can't raise prices above a certain level because they're required to by the government sell product at a certain price, then guess what you end up having? You have gas shortages like we had in the 1970s here in America where prices weren't allowed to go above a certain level, or you have shortages for bread or everyday goods and services because there's more demand then there is available supply. So that, to me, this isn't a necessarily a factor of corporate greed. Corporations can profit from short shortages because they can maintain margins, but it has more to do with supply and demand dynamics and, and the way the economy functions. Like people don't say uh, the, and think about the reverse, right? In my opinion, people don't say the reverse. Oh, corporations are cutting prices on all these computers they have because they order too many and there are way too many computers. Corporations are all of a sudden charity cases. They're cutting prices. How nice of them. No, I'm not going to give corporations credit. Just like I'm not going to say corporations are trying to be greedy, I'm not going to give corporations credit for lowering prices and suggesting that they're charities because they're not. They're just responding to supply and demand. So I don't know. That, that comment generally always bugs me. Uh, then, uh, I don't know. Jack, do you have anything to add? No. No? All right. Uh, let's see here. What about, uh, let's do another maybe one or two of these. Stories like this after the election make me skeptical of journalistic integrity. Uh, okay, well, all right. I, I mean, they're, they're, like what they're reporting is not 
wrong. Some things are still expensive, but the trend of many things is down. Freight costs, chicken, commodities, rents, they're not wrong about that, right? And they've been talking about these sort of changes all the time. So I think it's just potentially convenient that people leave these comments. You mean greedflation is letting up? Check the profits for these companies. Corporate greed is what's destroying America. Pretty cynical view. I don't necessarily agree with that. Funny how the inflation pandemic uh, panic ended after the elections. Uh, yeah, a lot of cynicism here in the Washington Post. Good Lord. Well, you know what? That is what it is. Anyway, let me know what you think about this style of video. It's really us just kind of brainstorming together on a piece that I find interesting and responding to some of the comments. I'd like to hear, if, if you want me to kind of continue this and you actually made it to the end of the video, comment something like, um, hey, PP, more reactions. That'd be awesome. Just to let me know kind of what you like. I think uh, it'd be really useful for me. Thanks so much for watching, and folks, we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.